We're so grateful for those open arms. We're so grateful for your love for each and every one of us, even though we don't deserve it. You love us even where we are. Lord, we praise you for the forgiveness you give us, for the peace you give us, for the abundant life you give us. Lord, what can we say? You are our everything. We acknowledge you this morning. We thank you for bringing us together as a body. We pray that you'd open our hearts and our minds to your word this morning, that we might learn from you, that we might sit at your feet, at your feet as Mary did last week at the end of the message. Lord, help us to love your word more than the food that we eat, and to appreciate all that you've gone through and all that you've done for us. So Lord, help us to focus on you now. We look to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Bibles this morning, if you can please turn to Galatians chapter 5. Uh, we're going to look at verses 11 through 12 this morning, verses 11 and 12, Galatians chapter 5. And the title of my message is, For the Name of Jesus, uh, The Theology of Persecution. It was interesting because last week, uh, the whole week, I was in El Salvador and had an opportunity to go through many homes, listen to testimonies, uh, go to some very impoverished areas. Uh, step into these homes, meet families. And here's how God kind of grips your heart, right? And gets a hold of you. Uh, so I've seen poverty all around the world. You know, when I was in India, uh, I've seen it in some of the worst slums in the world. And I saw it again in El Salvador this past week. And I had prepared my message and I finished my message prior to going. And as soon as I stepped into the U.S., uh, I fly into Cincinnati, and I'm catching the shuttle to get to my uh, lot where I have my car parked, and there's a long line. And the first thought in my mind was, who in the world is coming to Cincinnati, right? I mean, there's like a half hour, and I'm sitting there complaining. I'm like, Lord, I just want to go home, see my family, what's going on? And then immediately images of what I had seen this past week came to my mind, and God was like, you have it good. And so God was able to grip my heart through that. But I was thinking about this when I was putting this message together, and I thought about this aspect of persecution. And here's what I thought about is the fact that this idea of persecution, this topic, it has global implications. And it is a true reality for many Christians all around the world. Uh, for instance, imagine Easter Sunday, you and I were thinking about what we're going to do after Easter service. We were thinking to ourselves, we're going to go to a family member's home, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt for the little kids, and then we're going to have a nice meal, and we're just going to celebrate Easter. So we all dress up, and we have no concern for, you know, just getting to church. We just sit through a message, and then we leave. But then imagine on the other side of the world, there were believers, just like you and I, who got up that morning, uh, went to a church in Sri Lanka, actually three or four locations, but little did they realize that there would be suicide bombers and that 300 people would die that morning with 500 more wounded. The idea of persecution is a reality for believers all around the world. As we sit here today, there are those that are still being persecuted. I, I think about Galatians chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, and this whole time Paul has been preaching and teaching about this idea of freedom. What does it truly mean to have freedom in Christ? It reminds the believers you have freedom from the law. You don't have to try to keep these works because God is satisfied in Jesus Christ. And that you don't have to try to do a bunch of stuff in order to please God because Jesus has given his own life for us. He has risen from the dead and now when we trust in him through faith, God is satisfied with us because he is satisfied with his son. We also have freedom in Christ, and we have the freedom of assurance that we are children of God, that there is no one that is able to take that salvation away from us. Paul has been giving this strong message, but I want us to understand something. Paul teaching this did not come without consequences. Paul is going to tell us, because I'm preaching Jesus, because I'm telling you the truth, he is experiencing persecution. He is preaching a faith that is based on the fact that we can't attain salvation on our own, that we must trust in Jesus. And Paul is telling us, because of this, I am experiencing persecution. This morning, I really want us to truly think deeply about this topic. 
What does it mean to truly be a follower of Jesus Christ? Ask yourself this other question. What is it costing me to follow Christ as my Savior? Second question is, do we take our freedoms for granted? Third question, am I complacent in my walk with God? Paul is going to zero in on this topic and he's going to share what he has experienced, what he is going to experience because he preaches the name of Jesus. For instance, look at verse 11 as we begin. It says this, And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Now Paul has been teaching us that we are not under the law, but we are under grace. But there's others that are saying, look, Paul is preaching a mixed message. Paul is telling us about Jesus, and Paul is also teaching us to obey the law. And so he had this accusation coming his way. And Paul is saying to them, you guys have lost it. You're accusing me of so many different things. You accuse me uh, of abandoning the law and saying bad things about it. And Paul has told us that the law is good and points us to Jesus Christ in the need of a Savior. But there are those that are accusing Paul now and saying, Paul, you're trying to have it both ways. And Paul is saying, you've lost your minds. If I am preaching the law, why do I still experience persecution? Here's the first thing is this, is that Paul is stating that if he was preaching the law, he would not be experiencing the persecution he was currently undergoing. Now, I want to stop here for a moment and focus on this word persecution, because then this is where my message is going to go this morning. For instance, there's a ministry that you all need to familiarize yourself with. It's called Open Doors. They do ministry throughout the world in reaching uh, Christians that are suffering persecution. They, they aid them in many ways. They pray for them. There's prayer partners all around the world. But here's the definition that they give for persecution. It says this, persecution means Christians remain one of the most persecuted religious groups in the world. While Christian persecution takes many forms, it is defined as any hostility experienced as a result of identification with Christ. Christian torture remains an issue for believers throughout the world, including the risk of imprisonment, loss of homes and assets, physical torture, headaches, rape, and even death as a result of their faith. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do we have a concept of this in the Western world? When you came to church this morning, you did not have to fear whether or not there was going to be a checkpoint where some soldiers would ask you, where are you going, who are you, what religion are you? You had the complete freedom to leave your home and come here this morning without fearing any of that. But that is the reality for many Christians all around the world. You don't have to fear for some terrorist group taking over your community, but that's the reality for many Christians around the world. Persecution is a real thing. But there is plenty of scriptural evidence given to us that following Jesus comes with a price tag. There is a cost to following Christ. How do I know this? Because Jesus himself told us this. For instance, look at Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 through 20. Jesus tells his disciples this, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, and you can underline that word if you have it in your Bible, on my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Can you imagine the disciples being given this by Jesus? You know, they're thinking to themselves, you know, we're with Jesus, He's discipling us. And then Jesus says, oh, by the way, I'm going to send you out. You're going to proclaim the gospel. Oh, yes, and you're going to be flogged. You're going to be mocked. People are going to be against you. They're going to hate you. But he says, don't worry, because I'm going to give you the words that you are to say. Acts chapter 1, verses 7 through 8. Another important passage. Jesus, this is right before ascending into heaven. It says that he says to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has sent by his own authority, 
But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I want you to think about the word witnesses. The original word for witnesses or witness is the word where we get martyr. Someone who is martyred for their faith. Here's what Jesus tells them. When I send you out to proclaim the gospel, whether it's in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, you are basically going out with no guarantee of ever coming back. I'm sending you out to die. So I want you to consider and think about this. When you share the gospel with someone or you witness to someone, you understand that such an act could possibly cost you your life. At the minimum, they would mock you and scoff you. Jesus sends us out to be his witnesses. Here's what I found out. We as believers are too consumed with people liking us. We, we don't want to offend anyone. We live in a culture today. You can't offend someone. Don't tell them what they are doing is wrong. Don't call that sin. Don't say there's such a thing as right and wrong. And so we are so concerned about what everyone else is saying that we forget what God has commissioned us to do. Jesus tells us to go out and be his witnesses, be his martyrs, and understand that it could cost us our lives. I think about the fact that Jesus says to us, take up your cross and follow me. Do you realize the cross was a symbolism and a reality of death? Jesus says that if you want to be my disciples, you have to be willing to die to yourselves so my life can be manifest in you and through you. Many of us are still too busy telling Jesus what we want him to do for us. God, you know, you don't understand. I've got all my plans. I've got all these things that I want to do. Here's the places that I want to go. And these are the things that I want for my family. And God, if you will bless me with all of these things, then I'll do whatever you say. And Jesus says, no, the moment you surrender to me is the moment you die to yourself. Believers experience it all around the world. For instance, I don't have it up here, but I want you to think about this. This ministry, Open Doors, uh, have some statistics in terms of the kind of persecution that is occurring all around the world. I want you to consider this for a moment and think about the life that you live today. Every month, on average, 345 Christians are killed for faith-related reasons. 345 of your brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world, every single month, are killed for faith-related reasons. Every single month, on average, 105 churches and Christian buildings are burned or attacked. Every single month. You don't hear that about in the news, do you? You don't hear about the kind of persecution. But it happens. How about this? 219 Christians are detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned every single month. It is a reality for believers all around the world. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, it comes with a cost. It comes with the cost of dying to yourself, for suffering, for being ridiculed for the name of Jesus. A reality for believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, all around the world. So we know that Jesus has told us that there is a, such a thing as persecution, that if we are to be his witnesses, that we will experience ridicule, even to the point of it may cost us our life. But ask this question to yourself, what is the reason for persecution? What is the reason that the world hates Christians so much? Look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Here's what Jesus says. Blessed are those who persecute you for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. And look at these words, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What is the reason for persecution? It is persecution because of Jesus Christ. 
For instance, if you look at verses 10 through 12, in verse 11 it says that you will be falsely accused for my sake. It literally means on account of. There is a direct correlation between persecution and Jesus Christ and those who choose to follow him. Do you realize that Jesus is not liked by people? Jesus is not liked by people. For instance, I encourage you, try this sometime. Go out into your communities and ask them what their opinion is about Jesus. They like Jesus as long as you say that Jesus said that you're supposed to love your neighbor, right? They're like, oh yeah, Jesus made that statement and I like that about Jesus. Oh man, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. You know, we love Jesus. You know, he shows us that he's a servant. You know, he shows us, you know, how to love people. You know, he cleanses the leper. You know, he, he invites sinners. And people love that stuff about Jesus. But the moment you tell them that he's the only way to heaven, everything goes crazy. You know, I think about Jesus' ministry. I guarantee you, Jesus would not be invited to many church growth conferences. I'm telling you, there's a lot of church growth conferences out there. Here's what they do. They, you come out there, and there's a lot of good stuff. They said, if you do these three or four things, then you can have this massive church. So you go to these uh, conferences, and you hear about all these things that you're supposed to do, is so you can get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think about Jesus' ministry. That Jesus is going out there healing people. He's going out there. He's rescuing them. He's providing meals for them. And they're following him. And the crowds get bigger. But here's what I find interesting about the ministry of Jesus. As the crowds would get bigger, he would say something that would cause them friction in their souls. And many of them would end up leaving him. The crowds follow Jesus and he turns around and says, Oh, you're following me. I want you to understand that if you want to follow me, you must be willing to take up your cross and follow me. And they say to themselves, Well, wait a minute. We're fine with you as long as you're giving us meals. We're fine with you as long as you are healing people of their diseases. But now you're calling us to commit ourselves to you to the point of death. Forget that. And they went the other way. Genuine discipleship was what Jesus Desire. Jesus requires that of us today. For instance, I want you to think about the phrase, my sake, or on account of. Here's what it means. He uses the personal pronoun, links the persecution of the kingdom people directly to a personal source. The person to whom the persecution is ultimately linked is neither the persecutor nor the one being persecuted. Rather, the root provocateur of persecution is Christ. The exact cause of persecution is not the presence of obedient disciples. The precise cause is Christ himself. The name of Jesus is offensive. And in many parts of the world today, it can cost you your life. I want you to consider and think about this. What would happen if on American television today, someone goes up and says, I believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. You know what's going to happen to them? They're going to be ridiculed. They're going to be called a hater. They're going to be mocked. You're going to see social media go crazy. But if someone gets up there and says, what? You know, you can believe whatever you want. There are many ways to heaven. Do your own thing. The world celebrates it. And do you know why that is? Because ultimately, here's my other one, is that truth will always come under persecution because it is ultimately a spiritual battle. There is a spiritual battle for souls. There is a kingdom of darkness that is trying to infiltrate the kingdom of light. And so we have to be aware of this, that truth will always come under persecution. Satan's desire is not that we come to know Jesus. His desire is to sway as many people away from trusting Christ as their Savior. John chapter 16, verses 1 through 3 says this, These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. You know what Jesus is saying? That even religious people will persecute Christians. Happening all around the world. Ephesians 6, 12 and 13. Look at what Paul says here. 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. There is a true spiritual battle for the souls of human beings. There's a spiritual battle that happens in your home, uh, in your communities, in your schools, wherever there is. Why? Because the sway is to get you away from understanding who Jesus Christ is. You know, I'll share with you an amazing story about, you know, spiritual darkness and, uh, you know, this, this battle that we have, the spiritual battle. There are many times that I went to India, and I remember going there, and I would go to certain places, and, you know, when I walked through the airport, you know, I was feeling fine, I was excited, you know, there was pastors that would uh, greet me, had a chance to fellowship with them, and it was great. But then there were certain parts of India that I went to, and these were some remote places where Christianity was not really prevalent. And the moment I stepped off the tarmac and I was heading into the airport, you could feel a heaviness come upon me. And you're looking around and you're going, this is a spiritual territory that Satan has control over. I mean, you can sense it, right? You know, I'm not one of those crazy people that's like, you know, I see angels and demons fighting and stuff like that. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I'm talking when you are in tune with the Word of God and you're desiring to do ministry and you walk out and you feel the spiritual battle that is there. It is a real thing. Why? Because the gospel liberates people. And we need to be aware of it. Paul says this, I experience persecution because I'm teaching and preaching the truth. Now, why does he do this? Here, look, look at what he says here. He says, if I am preaching the law-based gospel, he says, then the offense of the cross has ceased. He's saying, if I go back to a works-based system, then the cross is no longer effective. But we know that Paul has been preaching to us about the power of the cross. Now think about this. Paul says this, the offense of the cross has ceased. Consider a couple of things and some questions that I'm going to answer. Number one, why was the cross an offense to the Jewish people? Why was it so offensive? Number one, because they could not accept the idea of a suffering Messiah who would be crucified. You know, when, the, when they think about Messianic passages, they were looking at these passages in the Old Testament that talk about the Messiah conquering the enemies of Israel, sitting on the throne of David. And they were thinking to themselves, you know what, Jesus comes along and declares himself to be Messiah. Surely he's going to overthrow the enemies of Israel. And unfortunately, he did not do that. But if you read Isaiah chapter 53, it talks about the suffering servant. That the servant would have to die. He would be betrayed for the sins of humanity. So the Jewish people could not understand how a Messiah could be crucified. It was offensive to them. Here's another reason that it was offensive to the Jewish people. Because it didn't require obedience to the law in order to be made right with God. It requires faith in Christ. Well, when they look at the cross, it is a reminder to them that Jesus has taken our sins on Himself. That we don't have to abide by the law, we trust in Jesus Christ. It was offensive to the Jewish people. Look at Romans chapter 5, 5 verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith to this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have been justified by faith. We have been made right with God because of what Jesus had done on our behalf. It was offensive to the Jewish people. But here's why it was also offensive. Number three, it challenged the traditions and teachings of the Jewish hierarchy. Oh, it set them off when Jesus talked about a different kingdom. When he would quote scripture, when he would teach them the truth. Look at Acts chapter 6 verse 13. It says this, they also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words. 
against this holy place and the law. They were so, uh, in, 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 basically, they were looking at the law and they were looking at the temple and they were saying to themselves, how dare anyone speak out against this? Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22 to 24 says this, For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. It challenged the traditions and systems of the Jewish hierarchy. I want you to consider and think about something. By the time Jesus steps foot on this earth, the Jewish teachers had developed so many laws and traditions of their own that they started using them more than the scriptures themselves. So you can imagine as Jesus comes on the scene and he looks and he says, you guys have all these rules, but it has nothing to do with scripture. These, these are all legalistic things. These are all traditional things. But they have nothing to do with truth. And he challenged their authority and it offended them to the point where they were willing to blaspheme against him and put him on a cross. I want to challenge you in your belief system, in your walk with God. Do you believe something because it is the word of God or do you simply believe something because it's based on tradition and what you've always known? You know, here's what I find challenging about raising children is that we can impart the Word of God to them. We can teach them. You know, if you're a parent or a grandparent, you instill the Word of God in them and you're telling them about the history of the Bible and you're doing all that you can to teach them about the Bible and prayer. But there comes a time when your children have to make the, the faith in Christ their own faith. That they have to walk with the Lord. They're going to have these challenges and so it's important that we just don't teach them our opinions and our traditions and things that we used to do and what is right or wrong based on what we believe, but we teach them what the Word of God says so that faith can be real to them. To the Jewish people, the cross was offensive because it taught that the law was no longer needed because Jesus has paid the penalty for our sin. But I want you to think about something else. Why is the cross an offense in our world today? Why is it still offensive? Here's why. Number one, because it challenges the notion that people are innately good. You know, try sharing the gospel with someone and ask them, why do you think you should go to heaven? And they'll say, what? I'm a good person. Right? I'm a good person. It's all around us. Some of the most evil people will say, well, I'm a pretty decent person compared to that person. Do you realize there's always going to be someone who's worse off than you to compare yourself to? Isn't it amazing that people will never compare themselves to someone better than them? We always compare ourselves, we'll say, well, those people in prison, I'm not as bad as them, so therefore I think I should get entrance into heaven. Why is the cross an offense today in our world? Why has it always been offensive? Because it challenges this notion that people are innately good. Here's what the Bible says, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside, they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. You know what that passage is saying? Universally, there is no such thing as a perfect and righteous person. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin. You and I are children of Adam and Eve. The moment they sinned against God, they now had a sin nature, and now we come from them, so we also have a sin nature. We don't have to be taught how to do bad things, because it comes pretty naturally to us. You know, I was thinking about this and I was thinking to myself, you know, when I look at the world around me today, there's a lot of bad stuff that happens around us. But we as believers should not be shocked by it. Because scripture tells us 
because we have a fallen nature, we're going to do fallen things. So don't turn your television on, uh, television on and say, I just can't believe that happened in my community. You've heard that, right? I just can't believe it happened here. I got news for you. Wherever there are sinful people, there's going to be sin that's going to happen there. Don't be surprised by it. Because fallen people will act fallen. Sinful people will do sinful things. The Bible is telling us, look at the world around you. There's no such thing as a righteous person. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that standard is perfection. Why is the cross an offense? Number two, because it challenges the notion that our own good works can merit us heaven. Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says this, Therefore by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. James 2.10, For whoever shall keep the whole law, and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. It challenges the notion that our own good works can merit us heaven. Now you would think to yourself, I'm reading this in my Bible, and I'm thinking to myself, well, this is pretty common sense. But you would be amazed at the number of people who think that their good works can get them into heaven. Matter of fact, we live in a world today that is filled with works-based religions. Where they say to themselves, if you do these things, then you will have entrance into heaven. We know of people in our communities that believe the same thing. That if I just do a bunch of good works, if I just do it enough, if I just do it often then God will be happy with me. And the Bible says there is no amount of good works that you can do in order to get into heaven. I want you to think about this. Think about how oppressive a system it is to lay down your head at night and wonder if you've done enough for God to be pleased with you. You know, many of us struggle with guilt in our hearts, right, over, over things that we've done. You know, things that keep recurring in our hearts. And you know, when that happens, you know, we claim the blood of Jesus and we say, you know what, I have assurance of my salvation. The cross has forgiven it. But imagine people all around the world that when they lay their head at night who attribute their salvation to a workspace system and they sit there wondering, have I done enough? It's so oppressive to, to never have true joy to never truly know if you're going to make it into heaven, if you've done enough, if you're good enough. But I thank God for the cross because I don't have to wonder. You know why? Because I know. Jesus has paid the penalty for my sin, past, present, and future. I don't have to carry it. The cross has carried all of it for me. I have been liberated. I have been set free. We may struggle with stuff. You know, we may, we may wonder, God, where are you in times of trials and tribulations? God, where are you when I'm going through this? And we may wonder these things, but at the end of the day, the greatest assurance is not how I feel. The greatest assurance is not what someone tells me. The greatest assurance is what God Himself has told me, that if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. It is something that we can celebrate every single night. Knowing that my soul is in the care of my Savior. The cross is offensive because it challenges the notion that people are innately good. Challenges the notion that our own good works can bear us heaven. But here's the last point and I'll transition to our time of communion. Because it challenges the notion that there is one, uh, multiple ways to heaven. You look at our world today, it's filled with many different religions. Do you realize America is filled with many different religions? Yes. How many of you have ever been to a big city like New York? Raise your hand. Anyone here? Okay, quite, so some of you do get out. That's good. All right. All right, that's good. Good to know, all right? About 20% of you. Some of you never leave your towns, all right? So whatever to you, all right? But go to any big city, big metropolitan area, and here's what you'll find. You'll find mosques. You'll find Hindu temples. You'll find synagogues you'll find some of the craziest stuff in the world. Our world is filled with religions from all around the world. They're even in our towns, in our communities. They're all around us, people believing that you, there are multiple ways to get to 
heaven. But yet the Bible tells us that the cross is offensive. Why? Here's why the cross is offensive. It's John 14, 6. Jesus says to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's it. Do you want to know why Christians are hated? Because of that one verse. Because Jesus says, if you want to make it into heaven, you can't do it on your own good works. You're not going to be able to go through any other religion and, and have this workspace system. No. If you want to have heaven, and if you want to know the Father, it has to come through me. Jesus is standing at the middle of history, and he's saying, I am the only one that can grant you access into heaven. There's only one way. People don't like that. You know what I find about people? What I know about people? We like options. Right? We all like options. You know, when we go to get a car, we want to look at multiple options. We want to see different colors. We want to see if it comes with a sunroof, leather, if it has heated leather seats. Right? You guys all love that in the wintertime. We like options when we go to a drive-thru. I like to look at the menu, see what's there, and then I order the same thing like I did last time. <laughs> right? Yeah. Guys, you know this, right? When you go out with your wife to a restaurant, and the menu comes out, and she's looking at the menu, and it's like, okay. And she orders the same thing from last time. And you go there the next time, the same thing, the same thing. We as human beings, we like to look at options. What are my options? And we do the same thing. Human beings do the same thing with their spiritual life. We want to look for options. What's out there? Because I want to choose my own way. And Jesus challenges this notion and says, no, you can't have it that way. I'm the only way. You know why Jesus can say that? Because not only is he 100% man, but he's 100% God. He is the very image of God himself. He is full deity. And if he is the creator of the universe, if he is the one true God, then he gets to dictate the terms of salvation for our hearts. And he says, I am the only way, the only truth, and the only life. You want to make it to heaven, you've got to go through me. I think about this idea of one way, one truth, one life. It would be different if God just said, do a bunch of stuff, and if it's good enough, then I'll let you have entrance into heaven. But it's another thing to say, you can't do it on your own, but I'm going to sacrifice my life for you. And that's what Jesus does. He just doesn't tell us about the way he makes a way for us. Because we couldn't do it on our own merit. So he, he dies on a cross and he carries our sin and our shame so that we can have access to the throne of grace. I love this note in the commentary. It says this. Simply put, if Jesus is not the only way to God, then he is not any way to God. If there are many roads to God, then Jesus is not one of them. Because he absolutely claimed that there was only one road to God, and he himself was that road. If Jesus is not the only way to God, then he was not an honest man. He was most certain not a true prophet. He then would either be a madman or a lying devil. There is no middle ground available to us. The message of Christianity to the world around us is, you cannot have a middle ground with Jesus. You can't simply say he was a teacher, that he was a prophet, that he was a nice man. You either trust that he is the one true Son of God, and you have salvation for your soul, or you reject him, and you find the consequence of rejecting him, which is eternal separation from God. You cannot have a middle ground with Jesus. And when it comes to your personal life, I'll close with this, when it comes to your personal walk with God, Jesus is not walking for you to walk in a gray area with him. We like to play it both ways, right? Oh man, I'm under grace, but man, I can sin a little bit because I'm under grace. Oh, if I just simply just show up to church a little bit, if I read my Bible a couple times a week, I'm okay with Jesus. You know what scripture demands of me? That I would be sold out for the name of Jesus. That I wouldn't be simply somebody that's observing Jesus, seeing how it goes with my life, that I surrender my life to him, and regardless of what comes into my life, 
I am a committed disciple of Jesus. That is what He desires of us. And with that comes the cost of persecution. It's not to scare you, but who knows what could happen in America 10 years from now? 20 years from now. The same ex persecution that has been experienced by our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world will come here. You know what? i got news for you. America is part of a world system. It is part of the world. Can you imagine going up into heaven one day and standing in front of Jesus and Him saying to you, well, why should I let you into heaven? Well, here's my American passport. It's not going to work for you. You can claim your American citizenship all you want. You can claim all these earthly things. At the end of the day, America also is in need of a Savior. And it is only the blood of Jesus covering you that will be good enough for you on the Day of Judgment. I pray that we would be those who are committed to the cause of Christ, even if it costs us our life. But let's start with the basics every single day of understanding that our life is not our own, but we are giving it up to the Lord to use it however He wants to. Are you committed to being a disciple of Jesus? Not just on Sunday morning, but throughout the week. And are you committed to sharing the name of Jesus, even if you experience persecution? Let's bow for prayer. Father, I pray that you would just prepare our hearts as we enter into a time of communion where we celebrate what Jesus did on our behalf, that we didn't have to do all these works on our own, but that He took upon Himself our sin. And that, Lord, He paid the penalty in full. We do not owe anything because Jesus has done it all for us. I pray that we would rejoice in that, that we would celebrate that. Father, I pray just in these few moments as we partake of communion, Lord, prepare our hearts. Help us to examine our hearts. Are we walking with you? Have we truly experienced your grace? Are we living a life that is surrendered to you? Lord, speak to those points as we partake of communion. As we understand what you did on our behalf. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.